Uh, well, and today uh, we have a native British speaker, uh, which name is Lillian Nandy. Welcome to Slovakia, Lillian. Thank you. And today we will talk about how to create uh, the next generation of, uh, of billionaires. So stage is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name is Dr. Lillian Nandy and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give a talk at PyCon 2022 in Slovakia and you the audience for being here. The title of my talk is Creating the Next Generation Billionaires Part 4 Using Python. So, as this is a continuation of parts one, two, three, part four, allow me to quickly bring you up to speed with a synopsis of the previous talks. So, computer or programming or coding is now regarded by many as an essential skill for any aspiring, self-respecting, ambitious young citizen in an aspiring nation. And as such, it has been dubbed the fourth R, computer programming, along with reading, writing, and arithmetic. In recognition of this new status of computer programming, governments worldwide have launched initiatives to have it taught in schools starting at the very beginning of the school career in kindergarten through to junior school and all the way through to secondary school. And the regions in red in the world map are regions where it is deemed to be happening. So I have for the past few years have had appointments to actively lead and introduce computer programming to children aged 11 to 18 in UK schools and in doing so, I wanted to make it interesting, fun, educational, and also motivate them properly. Now, in embarking upon this venture, it came as an extremely pleasant surprise to discover that young people, children, are generally very interested in the subject, and they're really keen to learn about it. Coding has very positive associations with space rockets, driverless cars, robots, and they see a great future associated with it. But as The Economist rightly pointed out, the subject is so young that teachers and curriculum designers have little pedagogical experience to guide them. To put this into context, if we look at other subjects such as maths, English, history, geography, Latin, etc., these have been taught for hundreds or thousands of years all over the globe. So there's a great deal of collective experience and knowledge on how best they should be taught and how best people learn in them. And in contrast, computer programming for children has only been around for the past few years, and thus there is little collective experience and knowledge about the teaching and learning of them. So with such a dearth of pedagogy, I decided to develop my own framework. Now in developing the framework, certain key decisions had to be taken. And the first key decision is that we should we introduce a block-based language or should we introduce a textual-based language? We decided to introduce a textual-based language for every single age group right from the start. We decided that this language should be Python as it is the number one teaching language in schools and universities worldwide and the students would be in good company with this. So the rationale behind this was at the age of 11, children in English read William Shakespeare. In maths, they solve simultaneous equations and in geography in the UK, they write about the merits and demerits of excessive carbon footprints. So at these ages, they are mentally prepared to process textual data successfully. So, yet visual languages are very helpful. And we also felt textual languages are also enjoyable and within their intellectual remit. So the second key decision is that what approach should we e use in teaching coding? Should we employ a bottom-up approach or go for a top-down approach? 
So a decision was made to introduce computer programming using a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down approach. The bottom-up approach is a tried, successful, tested and traditional method in teaching computer programming to adults. Foreign languages and mathematics have also been taught in this manner traditionally. In this approach, the concepts and operational definitions of the concepts are taught before they are applied to a problem. Now, this is not the only way of teaching. It is not at all unusual that this approach will be somewhat alien to the modern school student, who could have predominantly been taught with a top-down approach, whereby the problem is specified, and then they delve further to see what tools are available to solve the problem. However, the approach was well received. This was then preceded with an explanation that programs are analogous to essays, programming statements are analogous to sentences, key words analogous to words, and we would therefore be learning about a word at a time, or a key word at a time, and learn about its uh, uses before building up in due course to create more complex pro programs. So the students liked this uh, explanation and buy in to the bottom-up approach. And from time to time, I was asked by the students questions such as, are you fluent in the Python language? And indeed, parents mentioned in Parents' Evening how much their children were enjoying and loving the subject. And the third key decision was that should we use traditional coding examples to demonstrate concepts and ideas, or should we create, perhaps, child-friendly, age-appropriate examples? Now, we decided to use traditional coding examples and see how they were received. We used standard mathematical examples to demonstrate concepts. For example, the children were shown a loop for generating odd numbers. And very soon, the children were gleefully writing their own loops to generate their own sequences. And they're absolutely delighted. This is something which they were learning about in maths, and they found it fascinating. Another favourite of the children was that of the generation of multiplication tables. But the programme which generated the most excitement was to sum consecutive numbers one to a million. That's the sum of one plus two plus three plus four plus five all the way to a million. So the children were amazed by how quickly the computer could compute the answer and to what large numbers it could deal with quickly and the simplicity of the method. Now the excitement was something to be held and something which is relatively unexciting for an adult can be really exciting for a child. Now, Alex, age 12, commented on the for loop, I like it particularly because it does all the laborious calculations so quickly and it saves a lot of time. It also el codes, eliminates human mistakes which could arise out of boredom of doing the same task over and over again. So, We had a good degree of success from this approach with both comments from the students and the parents about how much their children were enjoying the subject. And we found that the seven year, year seven, that's year 11 year olds, seemed to be better than year eight, which were the 12 year olds, which seemed to be better than the 13 year olds, which seemed to be better than the 14 year olds, who seemed to be better than 15 year olds. So starting properly from the beginning is better. Now, the students were also happy with this teacher-led approach rather than a student-led approach or independent learning at this beginning stage. And, of course, the best students are the ones who, who are motivated to do well in the subject. And as an educator, we find that a congenial home atmosphere is extremely beneficial. So, after establishing the success of the method, and we felt that the children had developed a solid foundation, we began to think of how to proceed further with all of this. We felt that we should be using Python to look at and analyze real world situations and use Python to look at various aspects of climate change came to mind. Now, in embarking upon this, we felt that we should be able to um, 
maintain the educational integrity of the topic, we should be putting our energies and time into both an educational and worthy topic, and we would be able to make use of commonly used um, libraries, such as Python data visualization libraries, such as Matplotlib. So let me take you on a journey of what we did then. In the first instance, we just wanted to get going with Matplotlib. So the first ex um, exercise was to create a program to plot a straight line graph of the form y m equals mx plus c with given coordinates. The young people managed this successfully. Please see figure one on the slide. Now, what was interesting to note for the 13 to 14 year olds, that they're also learning about straight line graphs in other subjects, such as maths, and they also plot them by hand in maths. So they've discovered an automated means of plotting them, and that absolutely delighted them. Now for exercise two. We are always hearing about our huge world carbon footprint and how we should take measures to reduce it. We are also told that it is human beings, i.e. the population, which is by and large responsible for this. So let us start by looking at the world population and within it, the population of the G7 countries. So the young people created a program with real data, which shows the population of different G7 countries. See, please see figure two. The young people were particularly struck by the huge difference in populations of Canada and the US, two neighboring countries with similar land mass. Now we always have a um, require a reference frame when we look at these things. And the reference frame we used here was the world population, which is about 7,753 million, and with a G7 population of about 771 million, so the G7 countries represent about 9% of the total global population. And the children also programmed that. For exercise three, the young people constructed programs to create pie charts showing the relative populations of the G7 nations. Please see figure 3A. Here they were struck by the fact that using matplotlib, the segments of the pie chart could be exploded and also you could write the percentages on the segments. And how one could generate this type of visual representation with relative ease. This is something which they felt would be hard to do manually. The young people also wrote code to generate figure 3B, which shows the relative population of the G7 countries to the world population, which is about 9% of the total world population. Exercise four. The young people constructed programs for bar charts which show the land mass of the different G7 countries. Please see figure four. The young people were struck um, about how the US and Canada have a similar land mass and how much more they have compared to the other G7 nations. For comparison, they noted that the G7 countries occupy about 4% of the total global land mass. Exercise five. The young people constructed programs for bar charts, which show the carbon dioxide output for the different G7 countries. Please see figure five. The young people were struck by the larger carbon dioxide output of the USA in absolute terms, far outstripping other nations. And the G7 carbon dioxide output is around 25 to 27% of the world carbon dioxide output. And that's something they also did calculate. Exercise six, they looked further into carbon dioxide output. So the young people created programs which look at carbon dioxide output in terms of its population. Please see figure six. Here, the young people were struck by now how Canada appeared to rank second in the stakes. 
The young people also calculated average carbon dioxide of G7 countries per million people in million metric tons per million people, and they got a figure of 10.2. They then went to calculate the average, uh, or the rather the equivalent average world carbon dioxide output per million people in million metric term tons per million people, and they got 4.49. So percentage average carbon dioxide output of G7 countries per million people in million metric tons per million people compared to that of the world is around 2.27 times more. A rather precocious child commented on seeing this. If the average carbon dioxide consumption for G7 countries is encouraged and replicated by all countries of the world, the world will surely perish within 10 years. Exercise seven. Last but not least, the young people looked at carbon dioxide emissions versus land mass, and we get a different story. Please see figure seven. We get a normal distribution with Germany, UK, Japan at the centres and the US on the outskirts. Again, we can compare this to the carbon dioxide emissions of the world. So conclusion. So the young people saw by using Python for real world examples that big data, data is a big window of transparency onto the world. Why continued research? Well, it teaches the teacher and the young people how to interact and respond to newly arising problems and situations. Such exercises enable young people to build a more comprehensive, holistic and balanced view of the world. And more importantly, such activities motivate young people to learn about computer coding. The classroom lessons should be done in conjunction with computer coding clubs in school and also outings to external seminars about real world applications such as in climate change, financial markets and medical research. So to conclude, let us finish with quotes from Plato about education, which I think are quite relevant. The beginning is the most important part of the work, and education is teaching our children to desire the right things. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Okay, the focus is actually on teaching programming, uh, you know, subject knowledge, not so much soft skills. But having said that, I mean, if you are thinking about soft skills, you are teaching them how to problem solve. You're teaching them how to analyze a, a problem. You're teaching them how to, they are being taught how to... Um, overcome difficulties. They will get syntax errors, they will get runtime errors. And you know, in order to be able to do this, they need to be develop they will be developing human skills as well. They're also, you know, if they're learning about say applications of um, Python in particular, say with re relative uh, with respect to say carbon dioxide output, they're learning about the world so they're that, you know, they're learning about how they're actually functioning in the world, um, perhaps what, what they can do to uh, modify their behaviour. So I think, although not explicitly teaching soft skills, but implicit in the teaching, soft skills are being taught.
I, well, I'm writing something at the moment. Um, at the moment, I'm sort of gathering um, evidence, so to speak. I mean, I do have, say, like a, a YouTube channel, which is quite well used, and um, sort of like a website, which is quite, I think, well used by our, our students, so to, so to speak. But um, I think you've got whoever wrote that question has hit the, maybe hit upon something, because I think all the sort of publications so far, maybe they advocate something as something a little bit different, whereas I'm saying something a little bit, or maybe a lot different, so to speak. And, and the, uh, you know, the evidence that I'm having, or the evidence that I'm gathering, seems, uh, it, you know, it, it works, basically. Which is not to say that the other, um, the other ways of things don't work as well. Maybe there's room for um, more than one way of actually teaching and thinking. Yeah. I think traditionally people were taught with the bottom up approach. So we know for s many centuries that the bottom up approach works in, it, it basically works because it has been done for many centuries and you can see kind of human output. Um, I think the top down approach is also good um, maybe meeting somewhere in the middle, to be, to be perfectly honest. But having said that, if you only focus maybe on a top-down approach, there is a danger that you only know what you have been taught to do. And if the conditions slightly change or modify, if you don't have that kind of solid foundation and background, maybe people won't be able to adapt so much. But, but yeah, it's just a thought. Um, how could you uh, measure practice and motivation of kids while using traditional methods of learning and teaching? OK, they have little tasks to do and programs to write. And you can tell b b by the way that they're actually um, tackling their programs and they are you know, able to write their programs using this particular method. Also, another way of kind of measuring it is how much they're enjoying it. And so if you go to like a parent's evening, their parents are saying that they're enjoying it and they're liking it. And that's not just say the top set or the middle set or something, even, you know, sort of across the so-called so across the spectrum uh, as such. So I think the real test is how much are they liking it? How much are they enjoying it? Are they being productive over a period of time in the lessons? I think it's fallacy to think that you know, they'll get something, you know, people get something in five minutes. It is over a period of, of, of time. Okay, I mean, when when you use something like, say, Matplotlib, it d there's an overlap of what simple s um, spreadsheets do, but then after that time, there are many more different types of graphs that you can actually do, and you get a lot more flexibility and a lot more. Of um, versatility, say, in how you even create a pie chart or even a bar chart, and you can create many more types of graphs as well. So this is like a stepping stone go to go on to um, create, y y you know, other forms of graphs and, and an analysis, um, which um, gives you quite a window into the wor world. Okay. 
Okay, I find that generally young people, even if they are struggling, the vast majority, if not actually want to learn coding. They think it's quite cool. And they think and they think it's they have a f you know they, they think of it as a future there and they sort of identify the great in in their minds the great and the good with, with coding so to speak. So for them, even if they are having a problem, even if they are finding something difficult, they have something in mind to aim for. Um, you know, before we start these lessons, we do a sort of lesson on applications of where it's used and also um, famous people in coding, so to speak. Um, so we put up, you know, discuss, and w one of their heroes, for a young person this is, and this is not only boys and girls, they, they like, say, Elon Musk, who sends rockets up to space. They're completely enamored by these people. So their motivation overcomes the struggles. Yeah. That's it. Um, in Britain, the vast majority of people in the schools and the universities use Python. Um, having said that, um, a few people use C sharp, or, or, or yeah, a few people do use C sharp. So it's either Python or just a few for C sharp if they want to do like object oriented stuff. Yeah. I've also, okay, I talked about 11 to 18 year olds. I have also, I've had nine year olds um, in schools who don't learn coding per se, coming in their lunch hour, begging me to teach them. So we had, I, you know, I sat, I have sat with them and I have, it, I taught them the for loop basically in their first sitting, they didn't have any problems at all. In fact, they were grasping it faster than the 11 year olds. So I actually think we can probably go down even younger, maybe even eight. Yeah. Mikrobit je programovateľný počítač, ktorý ti dovolí prepojiť informatiku s kreativitou. Dá sa programovať veľmi jednoducho a ovládať tak, aby robil presne to, čo chceš. O pár minút sme zvládli rozsvietiť vlastný obrázok na displeji a o chvíľu sme už obrázky diálkovo prepínali druhým mikrobitom. Mikrobit má v sebe aj super vychytávky, ako sú tlačidlá, senzor pohybu, kompas a teplomer. K mikrobitu ale môžeš pripojiť množstvo ďalších vecí. Tu programujeme, aká animácia sa nám má ukázať na LED pásiku. Ja som na ňom naprogramovala dúhu. Teraz programujeme podľa nôd kohútika Jarabeho.
Najlepšie na mikrobite je, že si viem vytvoriť napríklad blikajúceho robota alebo gitaru, ktorú ovládam tak, že ňou zatraciem, alebo futbalovú bránku, kde mi mikrobit počíta, koľko gólov som dala, alebo kúlové svietiace topánky a tisíc ďalších vecí, ktoré ešte len vymyslím. Mikrobit je hračka, ktorú schováš do dlane a vytvoríš z nej čokoľvek. Tak čo s ňou spravíš ty? Každých 60 sekúnd si 28 tisíc ľudí predplatí službu Netflix. Odošle sa 197 miliónov e-mailov, stiahne sa 414 tisíc aplikácií a ukradne niekoľko tisíc hesiel. Na internete sa toho deje veľa. A všetko najdôležitejšie sa dozviete na Živé SK. Živé SK. Technológie ľudskou rečou.